This is a lecture for Chapter 54. We're going to talk about caring for the patient with inflammatory response, shock, and severe sepsis. We're going to start off by talking about shock. Now, when we talk about shock, we're not talking about a disease process. We're talking about the body's response to something that's happened to it. So when we say the person's going into shock, what's happening is we're seeing clinical manifestations of the body's inability to perfuse tissues adequately. Now, there's a lot of things that can cause the body to go into shock. But what we need to remember is that there's a, it's a systemic response, and that systemic response can be very detrimental because if the body can't perfuse adequately, this can lead to multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, or MOD, and eventually death. As healthcare providers, it's very important for us to understand what's causing the body to respond the way it is. Because by understanding these causes, hopefully we can try to prevent life-threatening complications. There's a lot of things I said that could put the patient at risk for developing shock. These things can be changes in circulating volume of blood, or it could be changes in circulating plasma in the blood. They could be related to alterations in the heart's ability to pump blood. It could also be an alteration in peripheral vascular resistance. So we're going to talk about the different types of shock. With the understanding that, we classify shock by what is causing it. The first type of shock we're going to talk about is anaphylactic shock. And you've probably heard of anaphylactic shock because when you were in Nursing 3100, you should have talked about anaphylaxis during your immune chapters. So as a result of anaphylaxis, your body can go into anaphylactic shock. Just to kind of review, anaphylaxis results from that antigen-antibody reaction. So you're exposed to something and your body overreacts. Some of the more common things that you might see with anaphylaxis or in, that lead to anaphylactic shock, things like exposure to insect bites, being allergic to bees, uh, medication allergies, different types of food allergies, latex allergies, and sometimes we just have no idea why you have an anaphylactic reaction. But either way, your body is exposed to something, and rather than have a normal inflammatory response, it overreacts. I did post a very short video on what's going on during anaphylaxis that you can watch to kind of get a review. But what's happening during anaphylactic shock is the body's responding and it's causing vasodilation of the blood vessels. And when the blood vessels dilate, it, the blood starts to pool. And when it's pooling, it's not flowing or perfusing like it normally would. So when the blood pools in the periphery, you're going to see diminished or absent pulses, for example. Blood's not going to get to where it needs to go. And again, again, this is in result from your body responding as from an antigen antibody reaction. In addition, other body systems also react to the toxin. One of the most common is the pulmonary system. And as the pulmonary system responds, it causes vasoconstriction, which causes respiratory distress and possibly respiratory arrest. Now, in anaphylactic shock, we are concerned about the, the absent or diminished perfusion to the tissues. But you can see on here, if our pulmonary system is getting involved, that's going to be our primary concern. So our initial treatment for an, a person that's going into anaphylactic shock is going to be focused around respiratory status. You may have heard of something called the EpiPen, which is basically portable epinephrine for folks who know that they have the potential to go into an anaphylactic reaction. Maybe they know they're allergic to bees, and sometimes you just can't control whether you're um, exposed to bees, or you may be allergic to common foods like peanuts. So these people carry something around called, called an EpiPen, and when they can tell that they're going to have an anaphylactic reaction, they'll give themselves an injection. But one way to know that your um, treatment is being effective for anaphylactic shock, we're going to look at a respiratory status. And the best thing to check for respiratory status to see if we're getting perfusion is going to be looking at that oxygen saturation. So again, while anaphylaxis can cause diminished or absent perfusion to the tissues, we're really going to try to focus our initial response on that respiratory care, and we're going to look at things like patient's ability to breathe, and we're going to look at oxygen saturation to determine if, if what we're doing for this anaphylactic shock is helping it. The next type of shock we're going to talk about is cardiogenic shock. And just by the name cardiogenic, we can tell that this type of shock is going to be related to some type of a problem with the heart. So cardiogenic shock develops when the heart is unable to pump effectively. Something's going on with the heart where it can't pump the blood like it normally could. The most common cause is 
myocardial infarction, where the heart is damaged because of lack of oxygen to the muscles, and that damage causes the heart to have problems pumping. You can also see cardiogenic shock with myocardial contusion. Now remember, contusion means bruising, so maybe there was some type of an accident or car accident where the chest was crushed and the heart was actually bruised. It could also be from a cardiomyopathy or, or some type of a disease uh, of the heart where the heart eventually gets to where they, it can't pump effectively. It could also be because of a ruptured ventricle. So there are many different causes of cardiogenic shock, but again, the most common is going to be that myocardial infarction. Because cardiogenic shock links directly back to the heart and the heart inability to pump effectively, the mortality rate remains pretty high with these folks. Because remember, our body relies on our heart to pump blood to the tissues so that we can survive. Remember in anaphylactic shock, we said that blood vessels dilate and blood pools and we have a lot of respiratory symptoms. In cardiogenic shock, it's actually almost the opposite because the body's not able to pump blood effectively to all the areas. The body actually vasoconstricts in the peripheral areas because what it's trying to do is get the blood to the most important areas like the brain and the vital organs. So in a patient that's got cardiogenic shock going on, it's very common to see patients that have really cold hands and feet because, again, that body's trying to conserve and maintain blood pressure to the vital organs. So those blood vessels constrict, which takes the blood away from the hands and the feet. Now, as the body continues to not get the oxygenated blood like it needs to because the heart's not pumping, we start to see other signs and symptoms develop. So think about what happened back in heart failure. We said that we had respiratory symptoms, but it was because the blood was actually building up because the heart couldn't pump it out effectively. So it was building up and backing up into the lungs. We had respiratory symptoms. But these respiratory symptoms are going to be a little bit different than the ones we saw with anaphylactic. In anaphylactic shock, we have more of the wheezing and, and the resulting of the airway constricting or closing. In cardiogenic shock, we're going to see the respiratory symptoms more linked back to like a heart failure type of symptom. So we're going to really monitor our breath sounds for that pulmonary congestion and shortness of breath in the patient. The next type of shock we're going to talk about is hypovolemic shock. Again, going back to the name hypovolemic shock, we're talking about shock that is a result of some type of significant fluid loss. Now, we're not talking about fluid loss in general from the body. We're talking about fluid loss that causes our vascular system or our blood volume to be less than normal. But we can actually say that this type of fluid loss can be blood, it can be plasma, or it can be other body fluids. Remember that when we lose other types of body fluids, for example, in vomiting or diarrhea, we're not losing necessarily blood or blood or plasma, but we're, we're losing fluids. Whenever we have vomiting or diarrhea, it's actually going to also pull fluids from our vascular system to replace the fluids that were lost in our other organs. So regardless of what type of fluid loss that we have, What's happening is we're having inadequate blood volume that returns to the heart. Now, if we're having hypovolemic shock related to directly related to blood loss itself, we're also losing the oxygen carrying capacity because our hemoglobin levels are going down as well. So what would cause us to have significant fluid loss? Well, with hypovolemic shock, this is the most common type of shock that's seen with multiple system traumas. So you might have a person who was unrestrained in a car and there was a multi-vehicle car crash. So we have multi-system trauma. And with that trauma, organs become damaged and can actually bleed out. Other ways that this can happen would be upper and lower GI bleeding. Even though the blood is staying in the body itself, it's coming out of our circulation. It could be a ruptured aortic aneurysm, and now this could be directly from a trauma, or this could just be because they had an aneurysm that was building up pressure and eventually ruptured. But Think about the aneurysm, the aorta being the major blood vessel going to the heart. If it ruptures, we're going to bleed out in our system. Hemorrhagic pancreatitis, just the word hemorrhagic in front of it lets you know that the pancreas is inflamed and is bleeding out. It could be something as simple as a long bone fracture. If you remember back to maybe simulation, you remember that there was a, a fracture um, and we talked about bleeding out would have been a problem. Inside of our long bones, especially where that bone marrow is, if that bone breaks, it bleeds that into our body.
Losing other types of body fluids could be simple as um, excessive diarrhea and vomiting where we don't replace the fluids like we need to. It could also be a large burn area because if you remember back to burns, whenever we have large areas of burns where we have blisters, the fluid shifts out of the circulating volume and goes into the blisters. Um, it could also be intestinal obstructions where we get third spacing where the fluid actually shifts into third spaces where it's not in our um, circulating volume. So there are a variety of ways that we can go into hypovolemic shock. But the underlying cause or the underlying um, factor is that we have not enough circulating blood to actually circulate through the heart and circulate through our system. Next we're going to look at neurogenic shock. Again, I'm going to tell you look at the name, neuroangenic, meaning that this type of shock is caused by some form of an alteration in the nervous system. And in this case, in particular, neurogenic shock will result when there's an imbalance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation of the vascular smooth muscle. And what's going to happen is it's going to cause systemic vasodilation. While it's not affecting the body's circulating blood, it's affecting the vessels by causing dilation. There's two things that really will cause or lead to neurogenic shock. The first is injury. So when you talk about spinal cord injuries in the next couple of weeks, you'll probably hear about neurogenic shock. And you can see in this picture that there's an injury to the spinal cord, which is affecting that sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation. The other is medications that affect the spinal cord of the medulla, and the most common with that is anesthesia. Regardless of the cause, again, we said there's that imbalance between sympathetic and parasympathetic. And you may have to refer back to anatomy and physiology to remember what the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system do. But again, we said that it caused massive vasodilation. So we know that some of our signs and symptoms will include hypotension. As the vessels dilate, obviously our blood pressure goes down. What's interesting with neurogenic shock is that you would expect with vasodilation, with result and, and resulting hypotension that the body would go try to compensate by causing it to have tachycardia or increased heart rate to get the blood to pump more effectively. But because we have an alteration um, in the stimulation between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, there's been an alteration in, in what actually happens in the body. So with neurogenic shock, we've got the hypotension, but we've got bradycardia. And the bradycardia links back to the body's inability to compensate for the vasodilation because of this trauma or these, these medications. So then again, with, with vasodilation, we would expect our extremities to be warm and pink because of the, the vessels being larger, the blood is pooling in our extremities. Finally, let's briefly look at septic shock. And septic shock is directly linked to sepsis. And we're going to talk about sepsis later in this lecture. The sepsis is a, your, the body's response to infection. And with septic shock, those infectious agents are causing systemic decompensation, or the system is starting to break down. We get what they call sepsis refractory hypotension. And all that simply means is that we've got hypotension linked to sepsis, but refractory means it doesn't respond to usual medical management or fluid resuscitation. So we've got this hypotension that's not responding to our efforts to bring the blood pressure back up. With hypotension, we know that this results in perfusion abnormalities. So we can see things like lactic acidosis. We can see oliguria. With decreased oxygen to the brain, we can see altered mental status or confusion. With septic shock, our mortality rate is about 50%. But if we've got a patient that's got comorbid risk factors along with this septic shock, our mortality rate is going to go up. Because this is linked back to, again, infection, let's think about some things that can increase our risk for um, our mortality rate. Things like immunosuppression. This could be immunosuppressant drugs, things like methotrexate or chemotherapy. This could be the patient has a condition that decreases their immune response, things like advanced HIV. Um, this could be because your patient is older, so increasing age. As you get older, your body's ability to respond to infections and respond to abnormalities such as hypotension decreased. 
So your older patient is at an increased risk for septic shock. In addition, you might have patients who have pre-existing diseases such as diabetes, anemia, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And you think, why rheumatoid arthritis? Well, remember, rheumatoid arthritis was an autoimmune. So what are we going to give? We're going to give immunosuppressants. So your patients with rheumatoid arthritis, because of the treatment, their immunosuppressants already increased for septic shock at higher mortality rates. When it comes to caring for the patient who is in shock, our care period actually begins the minute we suspect the patient's even at risk for shock. And we consider this an emergency period. Our primary goal during this time is to identify the cause of the shock and to hopefully prevent the pathophysiology that's going to result when we've got ischemia and cell injuries that are related to lack of oxygenation. So we're going to identify and create the cause if possible. We want to maintain oxygen perfusion. If there's bleeding, we want to control that active bleeding. We want to make sure we're supporting that patient's circulatory status. That might include giving blood transfusions. That might include giving large amounts of IV fluids to maintain that circulatory status. We want to make sure that we maintain the body temperature. We want to manage pain if the patient has any. And we want to definitely provide emotional support. Patients that, who are experiencing shock can often get agitated and become anxious. So we want to make sure we're providing emotional support as well. So we said that our first step is going to identify the underlying cause. So again, our primary goal of management in shock is going to look, going to look at identifying the cause, what's happening here, and hopefully from there preventing the results of ischemic and anoxic cell injury. So we're going to assess for the source. Is it an obvious illness or an injury? Then other possible sources, things like hemorrhage, sepsis, hypovolemia. As the nurse, what we talked about some other risk factors, things like the patient's history. For example, are they HIV positive and maybe they are, um, their immune system is depressed? Are they on immunosuppressants? We said the age of the patient can make a difference. And what's interesting is that when it comes to shock and, and risk factors with shock, that the elderly we already identified as being at increased risk. But we don't want to forget about our very, very young. Our very young haven't developed their immune systems yet. So they're also at increased risk for shock. We talked about medications, things like your immunosuppressants, um, also illicit drug use. That was another thing that was in the video that you watched. Um, anesthesia can make a difference um, when it comes to neurogenic. And then we also want to look for other risk factors, things like a source of blood or other fluid loss. Do they have nausea and vomiting? Do they have a slow GI bleed? Things like that. Remember that shock is considered a medical emergency, so our management really will focus around our ABCs. So our primary assessment is going to look at our critical interventions, our airway, our breathing, and our circulation. If your patient's hypoxic, they may require that they have an, a, an airway place, and they might ha need to be put on a ventilator. For example, we talked about an anaphylactic shock where the airway closes. We might have to intubate that patient to maintain their airway to keep that airway open. In cardiogenic shock, for example, if the patient starts to lose consciousness because of decreased perfusion, if they lose consciousness, they're going to need airway support. So we want to look at our patient to determine what's going on with airway and breathing. We also want to make sure we're checking circulatory status. We said in some cases we get vasoconstriction, in other cases we get vasodilation. So we need to look at circulatory status. We're going to determine what the perfusion is. We're going to look at peripheral and central pulses. If the skin is pale, cold, and clammy, we know the blood is being diverted to basically enhance the oxygenation of the vital organs. In addition, we want to make sure we keep our patient warm. Again, I want to remind you that any type of intervention that we do when it comes to treating shock is going to be re directly related to the type of shock we're treating. And that's no different for our pharmacologic interventions. We're going to use different medications for different shock states. Some of the typical ones we'll use, antibiotics. For example, if we have a patient who is in septic shock, we know that the sepsis is directly related to um, an infecting organism. So if we'll give antibiotics, it'll help control the source of the sepsis, which will actually help with septic shock. Next, corticosteroids. Why would we give a corticosteroid for shock? Well, especially in spinal cord injuries, where there's an injury, there's inflammation. And when there's inflammation, it puts excessive pressure on the spinal cord. That excessive pressure and that damage to the spinal cord is what leads us into neurogenic shock. 
So those corticosteroids are going to help decrease the inflammatory process, especially linked with spinal cord injuries. Vasopressors, if you think back to pharmacology, our vasopressors actually reverse the effects of vasodilation. So the reverse of vasodilation is vasoconstriction. So that vasoconstriction can help increase blood pressure and help increase perfusion. With the vasopressors, although they seem like a quick fix for hypotension, we, all, we don't want to give those until we've actually given what they call a fluid challenge. Because if we're in hypovolemic shock, for example, and we need to increase the blood pressure, if it's because of hypovolemia, we want to make sure that we increase the volume to an adequate amount before we give vasopressors. Otherwise, we're just causing vasoconstriction, but we're not actually solving the problem. When it comes to insulin therapy, one part of shock actually makes it where your body is incapable of adequately utilizing the glucose in the system. If we don't adequately utilize the glucose, it builds up. And if it builds up, we get, we're at risk for hyperglycemia. So you might see insulin therapy used in shock treatment. And finally, it's recombinant activated coagulation factor 7. And just by looking at the name, activated coagulation factor, it means that this is a medication we're going to use to help promote coagulation. So if we're thinking about to hypovolemic shock again, maybe it's due to profuse bleeding. And if we're bleeding out and we need the blood to coagulate or to clot so we don't bleed anymore, we might be given this activated coagulation factor. So again, it just depends on what type of shock we're treating, what we have to do for pharmacologic interventions. And this slide should just be a review for you. This is the nursing management associated with shock. And we've discussed most of these all the way through our discussions of shock and the different types of shock. So our nursing management is going to be an assessment of the patient. We're going to look at that medical history to see if they have any comorbidity factors or anything that would indicate to us that they've got a certain type of shock. For example, did this patient just get into um, a car accident and they've got multi-organ trauma? We might look at them for hypovolemic shock. If they've had a spinal cord injury, we might consider them for neurogenic shock. So we're going to look at the medical history. That goes along with our risk factors for developing shock. We're going to monitor our vital signs. We're going to look at our clinical manifestations related to that inadequate tissue perfusion and hypoxia. What are we seeing that's telling us that the patient's not getting adequate tissue perfusion? We're going to make sure we are addressing fluid resuscitation and administration of blood and blood products, if we're, especially if we're in a hypovolemic type of a shock. We want to watch for organ perfusion and peripheral pulses. We know that if the body doesn't get adequate perfusion, especially to other organs, what happens when organs don't get blood like they need? Well, they start to shut down. So we might actually look at for something called multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, or MOD. And in multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, you've got altered organ function. It's usually directly related to some type of an acute illness. And in this case, with shock, especially with decreased perfusion of these organs, these organs start to shut down. So multiple organ dysfunction syndrome is going to be when you've got at least usually two or more organ systems that are starting to not necessarily completely shut down, but change their function related to inadequate perfusion. So we're looking for MODs. We're going to also try to maintain blood pressure and correct an acid-base balance if it's there. We said that when we have certain types of shock, we can get uh, vasodilation, which can cause us to have hypotension. So we're going to try to make sure that we can get our blood pressure maintained. We also said that there could be a buildup of lactic acid when, it, as a direct result of the cells breaking down as a result of hypoxia and ischemia. So that could cause us to have an acid-base imbalance. We want to make sure that we recognize early if the patient's got decreased blood flow. So we're going to look at assessment data. What's going to be an early recognition of decreased blood flow? Well, it could be peripheral pulses. It could be cool extremities. It could be that they're having changes in levels of consciousness because of lack of blood flow to the brain. If the patient's uncomfortable, we're going to do pain management. We already talked about emotional and spiritual support of the patient, but don't forget the family. We said in certain cases like cardiogenic shock, we have a very high mortality rate. So in those cases, we need to talk to the family. Think about anaphylactic shock. Think about how scary it could be to not be able to breathe, not only for the patient, but the family. So emotional and spiritual support. 
And finally, end of life decisions. In some cases, shock means that your body's actually shutting down. And in certain cases, when patients go on a ventilator or they've got damage to the brain because of lack of oxygen to the brain, there may be some situations where end of life decisions may be um, appropriate to discuss. In other words, are we going to maintain the patient on life support? Are we not going to? So looking at this whole big picture, again, it depends on what type of shock we're talking about and what we're going to do as far as treatment. Okay, let's move on and talk about sepsis now. And we're going to start off our conversation about sepsis with systemic inflammatory response, or SIRS. And what systemic inflammatory response syndrome is, is when you've got an immune response in the body, and it's usually in relation to an infectious or non-infectious type of clinical insult. So, for example, it could be in an organized um, systemic immune response to a burn or pancreatitis. It could be directly related to acute respiratory distress syndrome or surgery or trauma. Or it could just be directly related to some type of a infectious organism. But well, why it's important here, and you can see by the picture down here, is that we start off with the body having a systemic immune response. That immune response can lead to sepsis, to severe sepsis, and then eventually to septic shock. And I posted a really good video. Now, it's five minutes long. I try to keep them less than five minutes. But I posted a really good video for you that kind of defines for you what SIRS is and what the criteria are for a patient to actually be diagnosed with having a systemic inflammatory response. In order to have a diagnosis of sepsis, we have to have systemic inflammatory response first, plus a confirmed infectious process or a known source. Now, in sepsis, there's an effect on all body systems. It's usually related to inadequate tissue perfusion, which causes alterations in cellular metabolism. So we'll have alterations in ATP production, failure of the sodium-potassium pump, redistribution of cellular ions, interstitial fluid shift. All those things you can kind of go back to pathophysiology and, and kind of review. But what happens then is the cell ruptures. It releases enzymes. Those enzymes can damage other cells. Other things that can happen that are pathophysiological. Things like toxins are released that can affect other body systems. With sepsis, if we don't stop it, those toxins can cause multiple organ failure and even death. I posted a really good video. It is seven minutes long, but I highly recommend that you watch it. It goes through sepsis and it goes through the treatments related to sepsis. Things you're probably going to see again. If you had a chance to watch the video, um, they also mentioned something called severe sepsis. So we go from the systemic inflammatory response to sepsis when we actually add the infectious process. We move into severe sepsis when we've got sepsis in addition to single or multiple organ failure. When we get into severe sepsis, it's defined by three different things. Activation of inflammation, activation of coagulation, and impairment of fibrinolysis. So you can see we've got the inflammatory process going on. The blood's starting to coagulate. It's not able to break it down. Um, we also see hypotension. Again, we know with hypotension, it causes hypoperfusion. So we're going to get hypoxemia or in their arteries. We're going to get acute oliguria or no urine. And then we're going to start getting coagulation abnormalities. And we'll look at this all together in one big picture in the next slide. If we're looking at the progression from SIRS to sepsis to severe sepsis, we need to remember that there's three principal actions that occur in the body during sepsis, inflammation, coagulation, and fibrinolysis. As we progress from SIRS to sepsis to severe sepsis, the inflammation progresses. It goes from inflammation to extreme inflammation. And there are factors that go along with what causes the inflammation to go to extreme. But for the purpose of this lecture, you don't need to know the specifics. We just know that inflammation progresses to extreme inflammation. Now, normally, if we have inflammation, the inflammation is able to localize an infection and kill the invading organism. That's what it's meant to do. But when the inflammation is extreme, it often has other effects. It can cause vascular congestion. It can cause endothelial injury and dysfunction. And it also overstimulates the coagulation system, which moves to the next point. We get coagulation that blocks the microvasculature. So as a direct result of the inflammatory process, 
that increased coagulation produces thrombi, and they become emboli. And those actually travel and will ultimately block the microvasculature of the small vessels throughout the body. Well, if we have the vessels blocked, it's going to cause cellular death and then organ dysfunction. Another factor that kind of adds fuel to the fire here is that during sepsis, we also have a decreased amount of what they call um, protein C that goes through the body. And what protein C actually does is it tries to decrease inflammation and coagulation and tries to increase fibrinolysis. When we decrease the amount of protein C that we have in the body, our body is unable to respond and unable to try to decrease the inflammation and decrease the coagulation and increase fibrinolysis, which is why we end up with decreased fibrinolysis or the ability to actually break down the clot. All of this spreads beyond the area of the infection. And when all of these things spread, we end up getting systemic vasodilation and hypotension. We end up getting increased vascular permeability and cellular aggregation. We get extravascular sequestration. And we get microvascular obstruction. And to put all that in simpler terms, what we're simply saying is, is that we have accelerated coagulation decreased fibrinolysis are breaking down of the clots. So the clots are spreading, they're causing microvascular hypoperfusion or blockage, and that hypoperfusion is going to result in decreased blood flow to the vital organs. If any vital organ that doesn't get the blood flow is going to eventually start to deteriorate and fail. So this, this cascade event is going to lead to organ failure and death. So you can see where we need to stop it before it progresses all the way to septic shock. When it comes to mortality rates with sepsis, it's not good. Um, worldwide mortality rates are one to four. In the United States, it is the leading cause of death in non-cardiac care units in the hospital. Some of the causes for sepsis include immunosuppression from medications, could be chronic health problems, substance abuse, malnutrition. It could be directly related to surgical or invasive procedures that introduce those organisms. It could also be related to sequential infections that are treated with multiple antibiotics. We know that when we use multiple antibiotics for recurring infections, that those infections are going to basically develop it, um, immunity to the antibiotics. And when we can't treat the infections appropriately, they can cause sepsis. Clinical manifestations of sepsis are going to relate back to the factors of inflammation, um, hypercoagulability, decreased ability to break down the clots. In addition, it's going to relate back to what organs are being affected. So you can kind of look over the slide, just kind of review it on your own, and see depending on what area of the body is being affected will determine on what clinical manifestations of sepsis. Remember too that sepsis is a profound infection. So also think about signs and symptoms if you had an infection in the body. Lab and diagnostic procedures are listed on this slide. They're discussed in more detail in the video. Well, we're really looking for signs and symptoms of infection. The white blood cell count. Elevated or, or could actually be decreased slightly. Why do you think we'd have a decreased white blood cell count? Well, we know that an elevated white blood cell count is because of the body's response to the infection. But what if a patient doesn't have the ability to respond to the infection? We might actually say that their white blood cell count actually decreases because the body's not able to respond as it needs to. With blood glucose, we're probably going to see an increase or hyperglycemia. And this relates back to the fact that the body knows there's an infection going on. And when there's an infection, the body knows it needs more energy. So more glucose is going to be provided to help provide the energy the body needs to fight the infection. We're going to look at ABG, looking for respiratory and metabolic alkalosis and hypoxia related to that oxygen perfusion. I skipped over, but we're going to go back and look at blood cultures. Especially if we have an infectious cause, we need to look at what, what infectious organism is actually in the bloodstream so we can treat it appropriately. We're going to look at those serum lactate levels, and they may be elevated. If you can remember from the video, serum lactate um, reflects tissue perfusion, and an increased level will indicate that there's inadequate tissue perfusion, which means that when there's not enough tissue perfusion, the body has to, to produce energy uh, anaerobically because it's not getting the oxygen, so that anaerobic metabolism, a byproduct, is lactic acid. So we're going to look at serum lactate levels. 
And then we're going to look at coagulation studies. And we're going to look at, we're going to see a decrease in platelets and possibly an increase in PT, PTT, and INR because we said that as we progressed into sepsis and severe sepsis that the body tends to coagulate faster. So we're going to look at our coagulation studies. Because there's such a high mortality rate associated with sepsis, in 2008 there was uh, a campaign called the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. And it was geared for earlier recognition of risk factors by the patient or family. So it had patient and family education. It also wanted to promote universal evidence-based management in the approach to treating sepsis in the emergency room or the CCU. We've already talked about the airway, breathing, and circulation, and it focused on that. It also focused on preventing the consequences of tissue hypoperfusion, hypoxia, and identifying the source of infection quickly. Those are things that we've already been discussing throughout. But what surviving sepsis also promoted was the um, appropriate treatment of the infection. So it wants you to start those antibiotics quickly, within one hour if possible. And if you look back to the video that you watched on sepsis, it said that if we don't start antibiotics quickly for every hour that we're delayed, it decreases our survival rate. Also start with broad spectrum antibiotics. We don't want to get so specific with our antibiotics until we know what organism that we have. So we're going to start with these broad spectrum antibiotics so that we can treat all types of organisms with, with um, certain antibiotics. If we start to limit our antibiotics and their spectrums, we might actually miss being able to treat an infectious organism. And the third thing is we want to reevaluate this antibiotic every 48 to 72 hours. And the key with 48 to 72 hours or every two to three days is that within that time frame we're going to get blood cultures back. And when the blood cultures come back, we're going to see exactly what organisms we're dealing with and the concentrations in the blood. At that point, we're going to draw more cultures. So we're going to have this continuous cycle every two to three days. And we're going to reevaluate those antibiotics to make sure we're giving the right ones and that we're actually getting the concentration that we need to. And there's a good possibility that in that two to three day period, our antibiotics may change. So we're going to start them early, we're going to use broad spectrum, but we're going to make sure we reevaluate every 48 to 72 or two to three days to make sure we're given the right type of antibiotic and in the right concentration. And we're going to anticipate that those antibiotics are probably going to be changed based on our lab results. When it comes to nursing management for sepsis, obviously prevention and early recognition are going to be key. In addition, the nurse wants to look at what are the potential sources of the infection. Some of the common ones we see in the hospital are, are urinary catheters, or it could be a central venous or arterial catheter, or it could be a continuous ventilator support. Oftentimes, your patients that are on a ventilator are at risk for ventilator-associated pneumonia. So we kind of want to watch for what are the contributing factors to this infection. Obviously, with nursing, we want to make sure we are doing standard precautions, especially our hand hygiene. Make sure we're maintaining our patient's airway and breathing, and make sure we're monitoring circulatory support. If you think back to all the things that we talked about as far as symptoms and signs and symptoms and causes of sepsis, the nursing management is going to focus around what the patient is going to present with as far as factors. In an earlier slide, I mentioned multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, or MODS. I just want to quickly revisit that so you can get a better picture of what it actually is. We said that multiple organ dysfunction syndrome is when we have organ dysfunctions. And it's in patients that have SIRS or septic complications. Now, remember, SIRS was Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, or that widespread systemic infl inflammation, or it could also be related to septic complications. Um, again, one or more organ systems is involved. Triggers could include anything from multiple injuries to burns. It could be hemorrhagic or hypovolemic shock, pancreatitis, uh, ARDS, acute renal failure. There's a wide variety of things that can trigger this. But it's always a direct link back to that, that systemic-wide inflammation process that's actually causing these organs to start shutting down. When it comes to treating multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, first thing we're going to do is treat the initial injury. What is actually causing us to go into this, this dysfunctional syndrome? Then we're going to direct our care at controlling infection, providing adequate tissue oxygenation, restoring and maintaining vascular volume, and supporting organ function. We want to make sure we hopefully can limit the amount of damage done to the organs and actually get them functioning normally again. 